justified, we have peace with God. Be justified by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith. Happy Wednesday morning, and welcome all the online audience. Uh, today's Wednesday chapel message will be shared by Thomas Musa, and he's going to give us the opening prayer. Go on. Can we do that again? Good morning, everyone. All right. Um, just a quick review of what, we've been, what has been shared so far in the last two days. The first day, Enos was talking about self-deception. It is of the essence for every Christian to understand their spiritual condition. And that is why Jesus in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 5, when he speaks about the Beatitudes, the first Beatitude is what? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. They understand their condition. And then Junior yesterday was talking about how we need more Jeremiah's, he made some practical applications to our personal daily lives. How we learn from certain experiences that we have gone through or through the experiences of others. 
This morning, we're going to be talking about rending your heart and not your garments. With that being said, let us kneel for prayer. Oh, is this lapel on? I don't know if it's on. Is this on? I guess I'll just use this. Um, turn your Bibles to the book of Joel. Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, and then we're going to look at verse 10 to 12. Joel chapter 1. How about now? I guess that was my Can you hear me now? All right. Joel chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, to give you just a, a little trail of what we're going to look at this morning, we're going to look at two specific events in the book of Joel. The first is a devastating plague that has fallen on the people of Judah. And the second thing we're going to look at is a coming judgment that will fall on the people of Judah. Then we're going to move on to the book of Revelation and we're going to look at the fifth seal and look at partial judgment. And then we will see the final judgments we believe to be the seven last plagues and then make up application. See how you and I fit into that scene. Joel chapter 1 verse 2 to 4. The Bible reads, Hear, ye, hear this ye, old man, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Verse 10 to 12. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up, the oil languishes. Be ye ashamed, all ye husbandmen. How, all ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Verse 12. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. The people of Judah experienced a devastating plague on the land. The prophet begins by asking the people if this is something that has been heard of or even seen in their days or the days of their fathers. He goes on to say that the people should tell their children, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren, this is something that has to be shared to the fourth generation. It is a devastating plague that has never been heard of. Verse 4 states that if the palmer worm would leave something, the locust would eat it. And if the locust would leave something, the canker worm would eat it. And if the canker worm would leave something, then the caterpillar would eat it. The prophet is trying to portray how devastating the plague was. Every living green thing was eaten. The Bible continues there. It says the field was wasted, the corn wasted, the wine dried up. It was so bad that the prophet said the land mourneth. And then Joel goes on to describe that the fig tree, the pomegranate, the palm tree, the apple tree languisheth or have withered. Why? Verse 20 gives us a hint. It says, The beast of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of the water are dried up, telling us there was also a drought in the land of Judah. The prophet then goes on to describe a coming judgment that is a lot worse. He calls it the day of the Lord. If Judah believes the plague of the locust was bad, then the coming judgment will be a lot worse. Joel chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, and we're going to look at verse 7 to 7, for, excuse me, verse 4 to 7, and then verse 11. Joel chapter 2, 
Verse 1 to 2, the Bible begins, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like. Neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Drop down to verse 4 to 7. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as the horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. Verse 7. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his way, and they shall not break their ranks. Jump down to verse 11. This is the connecting verse. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Chapter 2 begins with a warning, blowing the trumpet, sounding the alarm, and letting all the inhabitants of the land tremble because the day of the Lord is coming. It is close by. The prophet Joel acts as a watchman, like Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17, how God tells Ezekiel, and he says, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Joel acts as a watchman that is declaring of the imminent destruction that is soon to come on Judah. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day that is dreadful to the inhabitants of the land. The Bible calls this army that will bring destruction on Judah as the army of the Lord. This army is seen as strong people set in, ba in battle array or in armor of war. Not only that, but it also says this army runs like mighty men. They will climb the wall like men of war. The army is described as swift and destructive. And as we know, historically speaking, when the Babylonians came for the third and final time, they destroyed Jerusalem to the utmost. It looked so desolate, like a wilderness, that Jeremiah states, even the carcasses of dead men shall fall as dung and none shall gather them. Do you know what dung is? I think all of us know what dung is. Do we know what carcasses are? Dead bodies. Dead bodies lying around in a field that is desolate. That's how bad the destruction of Jerusalem was when the Babylonians came. And the prophet Joel is warning the people that the day of the Lord will be a lot worse than the plague that first came. The two scenes are actually quite similar to what is portrayed in the book of Revelation as it was mentioned to you. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. But before I jump into that, I must give you the context of Revelation chapter 6. The context of Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 is actually Revelation chapter 4 and 5, a connecting scene that is not divided whatsoever. You find there in Revelation chapter 4, 24 elders around the throne. You find a throne. God is seated on the throne. And God in his right hand has a scroll. This is of the, F, of the essence. Keep that in mind. There are multitudes of angels. Around the throne there are four beasts. And John, as he's seeing in vision this scene, he is wondering who's able to open that scroll, to take that scroll from the right hand of God. And he's about to weep, but one of the angels, the, or the elders, touches him on his shoulder and he says, Weep not, the Lion of Judah is able. Jesus comes and he grabs that scroll that is in the right hand of God. And as he begins to open it, the Bible says in the back of that scroll were seven seals. As he opens, we look at the first seal, the second seal, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. But we're going to focus on, and also the seventh, but we're going to focus on the fifth. Look at what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. And when he had opened the fifth seal, 
I saw under the altar of the souls of men that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The fifth seal takes place at the peak of the Antichrist during the Dark Ages. This period we all know to be the worst in the history of Christians. We often focus on how the Bible was prohibited from the people, but we never focus on the persecution that the people of God went through. You read about the Inquisition and how many people were brought to trial and deemed to be heretics and pronounced to die. As you read books like, the, like Fox's Book of Martyrs, you read some dreadful things that many of these people experienced. They died through various means. You, you have the stake or you have the guillotine. You know, one of the, one of the worst ways of dying is the guillotine. You know, there's stories of people who would be pronounced to die or would, have, would receive the, the sentence to die. And as they're brought to the guillotine, their heads are placed there. The blade is not sharp that when it falls, it is stuck right there on the head. And the person dies a slow death. With these trials, the people of God cried out and said, How long, O Lord, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And a response is actually given to this cry that you find in the fifth seal. And I believe this is the seven trumpets. But the only thing about the seven trumpets is they are a partial response, not a complete response. When you study about the trumpets, they fall on two entities, pagan and papal Rome. You'd wonder why pagan, if you read the book of Acts and even historical material, you find that there were various emperors who persecuted the people of God. Nero was one of them. You read about the ten days of persecution, or the ten years of Diocletian's persecution. God's people were going through a rough time. And here is the response that is partial in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. Notice something that is similar in most of these verses. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, 8, 9, and we'll just leave it at 10. Look at this, verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and there were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Verse 8, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast in the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures. Do you see something common in these verses? A third part, partial judgment, that fell on these two entities. But the convincing argument that really got to me that the trumpets were partial is found in Revelation 18.20. Revelation 18.20. When Babylon is completely destroyed, the Bible reads in Revelation chapter 18, verse 20, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. In other words, judgment is complete. The question to the cries of the martyrs has been fully answered. Now the beginning of this final judgment is when the seven last plagues begin to fall. The seven last plagues are filled up with the wrath of God. They fall without mercy. No second chances. Turn to Revelation verse 16, chapter 16, verse 1 to 2 and 10. To whom do these last plagues fall on? Revelation chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, and then verse 10. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their 
deeds, who do the seven last plagues fall on? The judgments of God fall on Babylon and those who have received the mark of the beast, those whose names are not written in the book of life. Now, as people who proclaim to live in the last days, who believe that these judgments will soon fall when it is all said and done, how is it that we can be preserved from the last judgments that will fall on the earth? And this is where the prophet Joel comes back into the scene. Go back to the book of Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Verse 12 and 13. Joel chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. The Bible reads, Joel chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, and says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. God, through the prophet Joel, calls the children of Israel to repentance. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and moaning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Turn to the Lord because he is gracious and merciful and of great kindness. In order for the people to either be preserved or not to even receive the second judgment that Joel, that Joel speaks of, they had to experience the process of repentance. They had to submit everything before the altar of God and turn away from the idolatry that they were practicing in. Therefore, you and I, beloved, we are called to repentance. We are called to submit everything before the altar of God. Those who will be preserved through the seven last plagues will have to have submitted their lives into the hands of God completely. With nothing reserved, no open door for the enemy to enter. Complete submission to God. And it is fascinating that those who have completed, completely submitted everything into the hands of God will be the ones declaring the warning of the third angel's message. The third angel's message is a warning for people not to worship the beast, his image, or even receive his mark, or else they will experience the seven last plagues. And this is why we as a Heartland family and Heartland students should submit all to the altar of God, individually and collectively. Amen. You know what made Jesus so effective in his ministry? The fact that he submitted everything before God. I mean everything. Let me show you a passage in John chapter 3, verse 34. When he submitted everything in his life, something amazing happened. John chapter 3, verse 34 John the Baptist is speaking of Jesus and his ministry. John chapter 3, verse 34, he says, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth the, not the Spirit by measure unto him. When Jesus submitted everything, he received the Spirit without measure. And that is why he was able to do the mighty things that he was able to do. Complete submission leads to the Spirit of God being poured out on his people. Look at what the prophet Joel says in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, as we're coming to a close. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. The prophet Joel states that before the day of the Lord comes, the spirit of God will be poured out on all people. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. The apostle Peter applied this passage in Acts chapter 2 to the day of Pentecost. And we as Adventists apply this to the last days. We believe that God will pour out his latter rain on his people so that they're able to declare the three angels' messages, specifically the third angel's message that warns people about the mark and his image. 
And the only way that the third angel's message can be declared with power, it is when the Spirit of God has been poured out on his people. Friends, we are living in a time where we need to submit everything to the altar of God. We're living in a time where idols must be put away and submit all to the altar of God. When submission has been completed, we make ourselves available to be used by the Spirit of God without measure. And when we are able to be used by the Spirit of God, we will be preserved from the seven last plagues and then we'll be able to declare the warning that will call others to repentance and preserve them from experiencing the wrath of God. Is that your desire to submit everything before God? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for how good you've been to us. Lord, we submit every area in our lives, the areas that we have struggled to submit. We pray that you may come into our lives Use us, Lord, as vessels of righteousness in declaring the three angels' messages, but specifically the third angel's message that will warn others of the coming doom. Be with us this day. Sustain us and help us to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the great message and for our online audience, thank you for joining us and see you tomorrow at the very same time.